I'm so happy to see you all here today. You're in for a real treat. We are exceptionally lucky to have Laureate Professor Ingrid Sheffer here with us today. She is sought after all over the world. In fact, she's hardly ever in Australia because she seems to be talking everywhere all the time. Um, and I've known Ingrid for uh, over 18 years, I think. Um, uh, she, we first met when she volunteered to be the local supervisor for my PhD thesis. I had done it in uh, Canada, got all the data, and my supervisor, I was here, my supervisors were in Vancouver, and that was kind of far away. Melbourne is a little bit closer, um, and so she helped me out, and that's where we first met. Ingrid is an incredible player in the epilepsy world of um, research. She has, there is, I don't know that there is any awards that in epilepsy research that Ingrid hasn't won. Um, as well, <laughs> uh, she has won just everything that's out there. She's also won a lot of science awards. So um, in 2012, she won the Laureo UNESCO Women in Science Laureate for the Asia Pacific region. Uh, in 2014, she was um, uh, given the uh, Prime Minister's Prize for Science with uh, Professor Sam Berkovic. She was also elected as a fellow to the Australian Academy of Sciences in 2014, and she was uh, awarded the Order of Australia in 2014. Uh, so it is with great pleasure <laughs> that I uh, invite Ingrid to give her Dean's Lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Lynette, and thank you, uh, Professor Colling, for the invitation to give a Dean's Lecture in Wellington. It's lovely to be back in Wellington. I've visited with Lynette a few times over the years, and it's just a remarkably beautiful place. Every time I, I arrive, I go, wow, isn't it amazing? Uh, here are my disclosures. I'm very proud to disclose that I have had uh, two HRC grants with Professor Sadlier and numerous Cure Kid grants, and that has helped to fund our research team here, and uh, I think it's very exciting that they are so uh, integrated and uh, work so closely with us. Weekly teleconferences, just so you know how closely it is, it's very closely integrated. So I thought I'd start this talk with background about epilepsy. I know that many people in the audience will know a, a lot about epilepsy, so please forgive me, but um, epilepsy is common. It affects 4% of the population and febrile seizures occur in a further 3% of babies. Uh, seizures occur due to abnormal electrical activity of the brain, and we record that on a brainwave tracing, which is called an EEG. There are many different types of seizures, and 80% of epilepsy begins in childhood and adolescence, and hence it's the province of a child neurologist as we are. And when we see a child, we try and diagnose their epilepsy syndrome, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So before my time, I'm pleased to say, in 1975, before I got into epilepsy research, there really wasn't much known about the causation of the epilepsies. As you can see here, three quarters uh, of the cases are idiopathic of unknown cause, and only about a quarter had a range of causes known. So that's really where the story started with epilepsy genetics. When we think about epilepsies, we break them down into two broad groups, the generalised epilepsies, which involve bilateral corticothalamic circuits, as shown here. And we know that these are genetic, not on the basis of known genes, but on the basis of twin and family studies. And here you see gorgeous identical triplets, and they all have an identical genetic generalised epilepsy, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and you can see their fragmentary spike wave here. Now, the other group of the epilepsies are focal, and as you know, they begin in one part of the brain and remain, uh, may remain there or spread. And historically, the generalised epilepsies were considered genetic, and the focal epilepsies acquired. So people thought genes were irrelevant. And when we're talking acquired, we're talking about a structural abnormality of the brain, such as you see here with hippocampal sclerosis, scarring of the mesial temporal region. And we thought that many people with focal seizures had structural abnormalities, and genes were not part of the story. But that, that all changed with this disease, and this is a disease that I described in my PhD uh, with collaborators, and here you see a 40-year-old man. 
He has a condition called autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. And you're about to see him have two seizures, which are highly stereotyped, and he does this multiple times a night. With these seizures, he is aware, and so that also led to misdiagnosis because people did not appreciate that you could be aware with seizures. Um, and you'll see a little girl I show you later on, it, it becomes quite frightened with her seizures. So in this disorder called autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, it begins in childhood at around 8 to 12 years, and it's characterised by clusters of nocturnal motor attacks with a median of eight seizures per night. And these individuals may awaken with an aura um, and then they uh, go into their seizure, which is, has prominent motor activity. Now, some of those individuals may have very marked tonic seizures, so marked, in fact, that if they grab the bedhead and the metal bedhead, they have bent it with the force of their tonic contraction. Other people have hyperkinetic motor seizures. The EEG is pretty unhelpful. It just shows movement or is normal. And many individuals were misdiagnosed. Some thought it was normal to do this many times a night. Others were diagnosed with a range of parasomnias. And still others were diagnosed with hysteria because of retained awareness. People thought they were putting it on. It followed autosomal dominant uh, inheritance with about 75% penetrance. Now, I don't know if anyone here is in the middle of a PhD, which is long and hard work, as they know. And this is a bit of a story of my PhD because I started with these, very, these two small pedigrees. A year of my life later, we had 27 affected individuals over six generations. This was then mapped by my molecular collaborator, John Mully and uh, Grant Sutherland, to chromosome 20Q. And then with Ortrud Steinlein from Germany, we found the first gene for epilepsy. This turned out, to our surprise, to be a neuronal nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and the mutation was right here at the iron channel gate. And this opened the door for the epilepsies to be regarded as disorders of iron channels. And now we know of many iron channels relevant to epilepsy, but we also know of many genes that are not iron channels. So when you see a patient with epilepsy, you need to try and diagnose their epilepsy syndrome. And this is a bit like a puzzle where you have to put together a whole lot of factors, the age of onset, the initial seizure type of the child, the other seizure types, what developmental course has that child followed? Has the child had normal development and become abnormal? Were they always abnormal? That sort of question. Their examination and neurological features, their EEG and MRI findings, and then if you're lucky, the genes, and all of this together makes an epilepsy syndrome diagnosis. Now, this should be the approach to anybody with epilepsy, but particularly relevant to the diseases called the epileptic encephalopathies. So what does this mean? The epileptic encephalopathies refer to where there is abundant epileptic activity. Like you see here, these are one-second marks. There's a discharge every second in this person. And this really affects their ability to learn and develop. And the epileptic activity itself is contributing to the severe cognitive and behavioural impairments seen in these children and, and adults. And this is above and beyond what might be expected from the underlying pathology, such as a malformation, and that this person can show a decline over time. So the epileptic encephalopathies were considered acquired diseases until 2001, when a Belgian group found that in Dravet syndrome, one of the more common of the epileptic encephalopathies, more than 80% of patients have a mutation of SCM1A, a sodium channel gene. And now we're increasingly finding de novo mutations. Around 30 to 50% of patients can be solved genetically now. But the more we know, the harder it gets. So one gene causes many syndromes, and one syndrome uh, can be due to many genes. And I'm going to give you a bit of an inkling of that in a moment. And there are really many genes implicated. <clears throat> now, this is rather overwhelming. It's taken from our recent review in Lancet Neurology of the genes. But just to show you how bad it is, there are like 40 or 50 genes now implicated in the epileptic encephalopathies. But they do have some pathways that are involved. They're involved in DNA repair, transcriptional regulation, axon myelination, protein translation and modification, 
paroxysomal function, of course, iron channel disorders and synaptic dysfunction. So many different ways you can get these very devastating diseases. So that really is by way of background for where we're at now with the genetics of epilepsy. And we've filled in a lot of this space, although we don't have all the answers yet. So at the moment, I've been talking largely about the single gene epilepsies, which are often de novo in these severe ones, but can be inherited in the less severe ones. Um, we don't know a lot about the genes that play a role in complex inheritance, which is where you have multiple genes involved with or without environmental factors, and we really don't have a clue about susceptibility genes at present. But I thought I'd, I'd, I'd talk now a little bit about some emerging key genetic concepts that are really reframing how we should approach these issues, and I suspect a lot of them are pertinent to areas outside epilepsy. So the first thing is when you send off a genetic test, we need to establish whether the variant that you find, is it truly pathogenic? The second is the presence of both de novo mutations and inherited ones. I'm going to show you just how vast the phenotypic spectrum is of a genetic disease and also just touch on the genetic heterogeneity of a phenotype. One of the most interesting uh, issues that's coming to the fore right now is that of mosaicism, which is literally everywhere in all of us. Comorbidities are increasingly recognised with the epilepsies, and that the more we know, the larger cohorts we need. So I'm very pleased that Lynette and I are both part of large international consortia that is really how we're going to get answers to these big picture questions. So let's start with the first one, is a variant <coughs> pathogenic? And I'm sure you're all hearing lots of hype around next generation sequencing and about whole exome and whole genome sequencing. So whole exome sequencing involves sequencing of all the protein enco encoding parts of our genome, the exons. Now that's about 1 to 2% of our whole genome. And in any one of us, we will find 22,000 variants. So the key issue then is how do you find out which of those 22,000 variants is causing the disease? And there are a few things that help with this, but it really is a complex puzzle. The first is does it change the amino acid uh, and alter the biophysical properties of that amino acid and therefore likely alter the structure of the protein? Is it deleterious using in silico methods? And there are a whole host of different methods you can use that try and figure out is this likely to be a pathogenic change? Um, they may look at the type of amino acid. They may look at where it sits, all sorts of ways to look at that. But in silico means on the computer, and it, doesn't, it really isn't telling us the ultimate answer. They can still get it wrong. And is it a gene that does not tolerate variation? In the human genome, we have 19,000 genes, and some of them have lots of variation in them, and we're amazingly normal with it, and others don't tolerate variation much at all, and they are often more likely to be pathogenic. Is that variant that you've found in, in population databases? And this, this is really a moving target. Initially, we had the EVS um, from Seattle, and that had 6,000 people on it. A couple of years ago, we got exact from the Broad Institute in Boston, has 60,000 people on it. So suddenly, there are a whole lot more variants that are rare but still normal. Is it a recurrent variant? Is it one definitely associated with that disease, that phenotype? In an ideal world, you get a functional study of every variant. Does it alter function of that protein? But unfortunately, it can take a physiologist a year to do a fun functional study, so we don't have that for many of the variants we see. Is it inherited from an unaffected parent? If it is, then it's less likely to be causing the disease if your parent is normal. But it could be if the parent is mosaic. And the other question that we have to ask as clinicians is, could this result we've got in front of us, could it be wrong? The lab may have said it's pathogenic, but maybe it's now an exact and it wasn't there before. And if it doesn't fit with the phenotype, we have a job to do to establish that it is actually causing that disease. So moving on to the next issue is that variants can be de novo, so new in that patient or inherited. 
And one of the things that's becoming more and more recognised is that de novo mutations are found even in mild diseases. So I've already told you about how we're finding them a lot in the epileptic encephalopathies. But it seems that they can also be there for mild diseases and therefore explain them and also explain the lack of the family history of that disease, which is very important. In the benign or self-limited, as we call them now, epilepsies, often they can be inherited and the parent could be affected or maybe a normal transmitting carrier if the gene has low penetrance. It may be that it's a polygenic disorder and you have an inherited variant where it's on itself, in itself, is not enough to cause the disease and you require additional genes to uh, modify and uh, mean that the patient expresses the disorder. There can also be epigenetic effects, which refers to heritable changes in gene expression that do not actually involve the gene sequence, but are superimposed upon that. And we really have very little understanding at this time about environmental causes, but there's no doubt that environment's very important, and we see that every day in epilepsy. If a child has a fever, they're often more likely to have a seizure, or if an adult has a stressful event, they're more likely to have a seizure. Also, we can find with the benign epilepsies, de novo mutations. So we need to think about both sorts of inheritance pattern. I want to move on then to the phenotypic spectrum of the disease. And I've already said in the encephalopathies that one gene can cause many phenotypes and one syndrome can be due to many genes. But this is not just relevant to the epileptic encephalopathies, it's relevant to all of epilepsy. And the best example that we know of at the moment are the sodium channel epilepsies, which show very much a spectrum of self-limited and severe disorders. So SCM1A, which is usually everyone's favourite one, because it's essentially solved one disease, Dravet syndrome. And here you see uh, the sodium channel embedded in the cell membrane and SCM1A encodes the alpha subunit. And this is the subunit through which there is the iron channel pore for the sodium ions to pass. And on each side of it, there's a beta subunit, which is also implicated in epilepsies. So in SCM1A disease, most of the patients today have Dravet syndrome, which is a severe epileptic encephalopathy. And you'll hear a lot more about that in the next uh, lecture in this room uh, at 3 o'clock. I've got the time right, or 2 o'clock? 3 o'clock? Um, and uh, Professor Sadley is going to talk more about SCM1A diseases at that time and a very exciting new phenotype that we've recently discovered for that. And a smaller proportion have a mild epilepsy called genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures. Plus, you may just have a few febrile seizures. If we move to the beta-1 subunit of a sodium channel, most of the cases to date have got GEFS plus, genetic epilepsy with febrile seizures plus mutations, and they're just one or two with very severe epilepsies. If we move to a different um, subunit, the alpha-2 subunit of a sodium channel, at the moment, most of the children have got this very severe epilepsy of infancy with mi migrating focal seizures, or one that's even worse called Otahara syndrome, and there are families with a benign form called benign familial neonatal infantile seizures. So I think you're getting the gist that the sodium channel diseases come in both severe and mild forms. And that's why they need us, because you can't just get a variant and know what that patient's going to have. You have to put the genotype with the phenotype. And the uh, encephalopathies have both a developmental and epileptic component. And by that I mean these genes probably stop development in their own right, and then you have superimposed on this this very severe epileptic activity, lots of seizures, and that means that the child actually has more impact on their development and may regress. <coughs> and why does this matter? Well, the diagnosis in, is very important if you can get the gene because it tells you about the comorbidities you need to think about, the prognosis for this disorder, and importantly, the treatment. And I'll talk about that a little bit more <coughs> later on. So the next topic I wanted to touch on is the increasing importance of mosaicism. 
Um, and as you know, mosaicism is where you have a genetic change in some but not all cells in the human body. And it depends on where, how, long, how far along the human being is being formed and when, the mosaicism, when that genetic abnormality comes into play, how many cells will have that genetic abnormality. So mosaicism in epilepsy first became known in Dravé syndrome, uh, where more than 80% of patients have a mutation of SCM1A, so it's essentially solved. And we think that more than 90% of these patients have a de novo mutation. That's important because that's key for the recurrence risk for those parents. But then what happens is these parents get a low recurrence risk. You haven't got a risk of another child, and bingo, they have another affected child with Dravé syndrome, which, as you can imagine, is quite devastating. And that, of course, tells us that one of those parents must be mosaic, that they must have that mutation either in the sperm or the eggs and therefore increase their risk of having a second affected child. Also, we're now getting through our research program some patients who are actually mosaic despite having very severe epilepsies. We find their mosaic for a mutation. There have been some very uh, interesting studies from a French group of the percentage of mosaicism in Dravé families. And they studied 12 families who appeared to have an inherited <coughs> SCM1A mutation, which means it was present um, in, picked up in the parent. And they found in these 12 families that the parent varied in their percentage of mosaicism, the percentage of cells with a mutation, anywhere from half a percent to 85% of their cells had the mutation that gave their child Dravé syndrome. Where there was a lower percentage of mosaicism, under 45% in these families, the parent was normal, had never had a seizure. Where it was over 45%, the parent was affected with seizures, may just have been febrile seizures, but the higher mosaicism in the parent, the 85%, the more severe the parent was. So there was a direct correlation the other important issue is that your percentage of mosaicism differs in different tissues in your body. So what's in your blood might be different to what's in your uh, gonadal cells, to what's in your brain. And this is, of course, very important for neurological disease. Importantly, last year, one of my uh, colleagues in China reported that in so-called de novo cases in Dravet syndrome, when they drilled down, they found that 10% of parents were actually mosaic. And this is a game changer for these parents because it completely changes their recurrence risk. This mosaicism may be in all cells in that, pos in that uh, person's body, in all tissues rather, not cells, or it may be limited to specific tissues. So in a study that we have um, under revision with American Journal of Human Genetics, we have studied two sets of siblings. This is part of a greater study that I'll talk about a bit more in detail later in the next talk. And these two uh, families both have siblings with um, epileptic encephalopathies. The parents are unrelated, so that means we know it's much less likely that they have a recessive disorder. And given that most of the epileptic encephalopathies are due to de novo dominant mutations, we hypothesise that these parents are likely to be mosaic. So uh, with deep sequencing, and that may, may mean that you look at one person, a hundred different alleles of their genes, we found that in each family, in this case the mother and in this case the father, was mosaic in blood. So 6% in the mother and 5% in the father, which leads to their recurrence risk. And you can imagine then that they're really scared about having a further affected child. So this has major reproductive implications because now they could be tested if they wish. So I've really been talking so far about mosaicism in blood, but mosaicism can be limited to specific tissues. And here you see a nice diagram of mosaicism showing that it may be in the brain, but depending on the timing of when it occurs, it may also be in other tissues. And we now know increasingly in malformations, here you see double cortex with this extra layer of grey matter, a second layer of cortex. We know that many of the malformations of the brain are now associated with mosaicism uh, causing that malformation. 
But I wanted to share with you this very cool study that came out at the end of last year from Chris Walsh's lab at Boston. And this is where they looked at just normal people. They took single cell sequencing of 36 cortical neurons from three brains of normal individuals. And we like to think that the mosaicism is just with disease. Well, it's not. It's in all our brains. And they found 1,500 somatic single nucleotide variants per cell. They then looked at these cells very carefully and they found clonal lineages. So what they did was if you have a look at how many of these different cells share a particular single nucleotide for polymorphism, so a variant, and they found uh, that there's this polyclonal architecture where you can trace where a particular mutation came up and how many cells have it. And they argued, in fact, that this mosaicism may actually protect us. It may buffer the brain against a mutation that arises due to, during development uh, and modify penetrance. So one of the questions we've always asked is, why does one person in the family have maybe a more severe epilepsy and another one have a milder one? And it's possibly that we're protected by these variants rather than all being deleterious. So that's a, a, real, a really different way of thinking about it. I wanted to touch for a moment on the need for large cohorts. There is so much genetic heterogeneity emerging in the epilepsies that we need large cohorts, and by that I mean thousands of people. So we can't do this in Australia, and you can't do it in New Zealand, but we have to get together with the rest of the world. One of the other things that cohorts allow us to do is to look for pathways. So where you might find a gene, and I'll show, give you an example of that in just a minute, about where a whole pathway may be relevant to that disease and therefore may actually allow you to look at pathway treatments rather than gene-specific treatments. And it also allows us to characterise the phenotypic spectrum of a disease. And comorbidities. We know with patients with epilepsy that many of them have a whole range of comorbidities. And our job is not done as paediatricians or neurologists. If we haven't looked for those comorbidities, it's not just about the epilepsy. It's about the learning disorders, the intellectual disability. Autism spectrum disorders are extremely common. About half the children with epileptic encephalopathies have autistic features. Psychiatric features, such as depression or psychosis, gait abnormalities, and we are finding increasingly overlapping genetic determinants for these diseases so that they cause epilepsy, but they also may give rise to schizophrenia or autism. So it's a very important way of looking at our patients. So in the last part of the talk, I wanted to talk about epilepsy genetic diagnosis leading to precision medicine, because that's really where we're headed and you're probably aware of the Obama initiative to focus on precision medicine. So what do we mean by that? Well, Francis Collins put it very well. Medicine for most of human history has been one size fits all, but we're all different and we're finding out that the diseases we have lumped together under one label, such as epilepsy, are actually at the molecular level quite distinct. Precision medicine tries to understand what's underneath those layers and tries not to lump everyone together, but think about individual differences. And that's really how we should be thinking as clinicians uh, as we go forward. So I'm going to give you three different examples of precision medicine, how it might just influence your choice of uh, medications <coughs> in epilepsy, how the pathway can therefore lead to changes in medical and surgical management, and then in an ideal world where you could have the functional effect of a mutation and try and reverse that abnormal function. So I already spent a little bit of time talking about the sodium channel epileptic encephalopathies. And uh, we know of three major players now, SCN1A, SCN2A and SCN8A. And they're all associated with new mutations in these children who are very severely affected. They have different syndromic patterns, Dravet syndrome, Otahara, epilepsy of infancy with migrating focal seizures. These are all small print, I realise, but they have different patterns. And sometimes people will say, well, does it really matter? Does, does it make a difference if I know which gene they have or will my treatment be the same? Well, I put it to you that it absolutely does. And we know in Dravet syndrome, 
that many of the children uh, get worse with sodium channel blockers and the bad guy is tegretol carbamazepine. And in fact, ironically enough, when Charlotte Dravet described Dravet syndrome, she called it severe myoclonic epilepsy of infancy because they gave them all tegretol and that all triggered their myoclonus. So in fact, the myoclonus is much less now that we know we shouldn't be giving my, uh, tegretol. Uh, Lamotrigine is a bit contentious. I have patients that have benefited with it and patients that have got worse. But we also need to know which drugs work, and these ones are all very good for Drave syndrome. What about the other guys, SCN8A and SCN2A? Well, they're the opposite. They actually do much better with sodium channel blockers, um, and they often have gain-of-function mutations. They do very well with carbamazepine and high-dose phenytoin. So knowing the gene here really changes my approach to treating these children. So let's move on to the genetic pathway diagnosis. And this is um, very uh, interesting work that is changing a particularly focal epilepsy for adult neurology and for child neurology, but for adult neurology particularly. Now, this also came from a syndrome from my PhD, which we now call familial focal epilepsy with variable foci. And this interesting disorder was first found in a single family where they had focal epilepsy coming from different parts of the brain. And here you see the original family, and you can see some people in red have frontal lobe epilepsy, including the proband, and I'll tell you a bit more about her later. Uh, some in blue have temporal lobe epilepsy, and this chap here has parietal lobe epilepsy. Interestingly, these three individuals have autism spectrum disorder, and these two have intellectual disability. And we think that this gene uh, that causes the disease in this family, DEPDEC5, is probably responsible for all of these features. So with our molecular colleagues, we performed whole exome sequencing in this family and found a, mut uh, a mutation of this gene, which has this horrific name. I'm not even going to try and say it. Um, and it's called DEPDC5, and I like to call it DEPDEC5 because Australians like to abbreviate, as I'm sure you know. So we then went and looked at all the families in the literature with this disorder of familial focal epilepsy with variable foci, and of the eight families, seven had mutations of DEPDEC5, and the penetrance was quite low at 66%, meaning that it didn't always look like it was genetic. So we thought, that's very nice. We found the gene for a common epilepsy. But we thought maybe it's more important than that. Now, in all epilepsy, 60% is focal. So it's a very important bin of, in terms of a whole lot of epilepsies that we look at. And many of the patients that we see have no structural cause, which means the MRI is normal. So until even now, many people remain cynical that they could have a genetic cause for their epilepsy. So what we did was we looked at 82 families with two or more individuals with focal epilepsy, and we sequenced DEPDEC5 in these 82 families, and we found that 10 of the 82 families had DEPDEC5 mutations. So instead of it being relevant just to a very rare large family disease, it's now important to small families with just a couple of people with focal epilepsy. We then went back to our 95 affected individuals over all these families now and said, what do they look like? And they basically have frontotemporal epilepsies uh, with only a few having more posterior epilepsies and one child having autism without epilepsy. So the burning question is, why then does one person in the family have frontal lobe epilepsy and another person in the family have temporal lobe epilepsy? Well, we're very lucky because two months after we published the gene, our Boston group published what it did. And this uh, gene encodes DEPDEC5 as part of the mTOR pathway, which, as you know, is a key regulator of cell growth and metabolism. And when you have amino acids, they come to the lysis, to the uh, nuclear membrane, the cell membrane. This triggers uh, the mTOR pathway and triggers the lysosome to tell the nucleus to start growth. And what they showed was that DEPDEC5 is part of a GATOR1 complex, which includes three different proteins, NPRL2 and NPRL3. And the job of this GATOR1 complex is that when you have amino acid starvation, the GATOR1 complex represses this pathway 
and stops growth. So when you have a mutation in Deptic 5, you get abnormal growth. And this is akin to tuberous sclerosis, which, as you know, is the prototypic enteropathy. Uh, and in tuberous sclerosis, we know you have a mutation and you get abnormal growths in the brain with tubers being typical. So when we realised that Deptic 5 was part of the mTOR pathway, we looked at some other families. And this family we've been studying for about 15 years. There are six affected males, five of whom have nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. And what was staggering about this family was that there are four men with normal MRIs, but these two men have abnormal MRIs. This one also has prominent psychiatric features with bipolar disorder, and his brother has psychosis, and this one has intellectual disability. But this patient has a very marked abnormality of his brain. He has a focal cortical dysplasia that you can see here uh, in the frontal lobe. This cousin of his has a much more subtle focal cortical dysplasia. And we'd always thought this family was very interesting because within one family you have focal epilepsy, but some people have lesions and some do not. And we were chasing for many years the X chromosome for obvious reasons, but it wasn't on the X chromosome. We did whole exome sequencing, and bingo, they had a truncation mutation of Deptic 5. So that made us go back to our original family, and we did a whole ex not whole on, we did three Tesla MRI studies on five members of this family, including the proband, who is my patient. And we looked at her MRI many times before, not seeing a mutation. And then with the eye of this disease, we went back and looked again. And she has um, a focal cortical dysplasia as well. Now, for her, this is a game changer. She's 28 years old. She's on four anti-epileptic drugs and um, she's been seizure-free finally for seven years, and then last year she had three seizures again, and I tweaked her drugs. But when she wants to have children, the question is, should she really be on four anti-epileptic drugs, or should we try and think about epilepsy surgery? And that's a conversation that we've started to have, because now we know where to operate. So what's the pathology of Deptic 5? Here you see two other boys uh, treated with, by Simon Harvey in Melbourne, and uh, in this paper, what we've done is look at the pathology of their um, resections. This boy has a, um, a hemifocal cortical dysplasia, and this one has a quadrantic focal cortical dysplasia. Their father and uncle had mild focal epilepsy. Under the microscope, they have focal cortical dysplasia type 2A with dysmorphic cytomegalic neurons. And then with phospho S6 staining, which looks at mTOR activation, you see uh, that there is upregulation of the mTOR pathway. Now, numerous groups have now looked at Deptec 5 pathology, and different forms of focal cortical dysplasia have been found, suggesting, in fact, that it's a spectrum. One of uh, my colleagues, then, Ampaduri in Boston, took this further. And she looked at sporadic rather than familial cases of focal cortical dysplasia. And she found in this patient and in this patient germline uh, mutations of Deptec 5. And uh, she also looked at hemimegancephaly. And you can see here two patients with hemimegancephaly. And they also had germline mutations of Deptec 5. So if we think about the big picture of the mTORopathies, they have many proteins in this pathway, and now many are associated with hemimegancephaly, and many are associated with focal cortical dysplasia. And last year, we published a paper describing NPRL2 and NPRL3 mutations, and NPRL2 is also associated with, poly with polymicrogyria. So there's really a pathway picture emerging here uh, of these genes being involved with mutations that can be germline, but equally that can be mosaic, causing these diseases. So how does this help us in the clinic? Well, hyperactivation of the mTOR pathway is certainly associated with epilepsy, and we like to think of the GATOR1 epilepsies as a form of tuberous sclerosis light, if you will. So tuberous sclerosis <coughs> is associated with tubers, lots of them often in the brain, versus uh, focal cortical dysplasia in uh, GATOR1 epilepsies. They are both associated with focal epilepsies, 
They both be begin infancy or childhood or maybe a bit later in the gait or one epilepsies, both associated with intellectual disability, but it's rare in the gait or one epilepsies. Autism is rarer. Both can occur with familial or de novo mutations and variable pe penetrance, and both associated with dysplastic lesions. So how does this change the game in a precision medicine approach? Well, firstly, it allows us to think about the mTOR inhibitors, which, as you know, have been used in tuberous sclerosis. They have reduced the size of tumours in this disease and have also improved seizures. But the question is, are they relevant much more broadly to the epilepsies and something we should be considering? And it also changes our surgical approach, whereas previously I would have said if you had a gene abnormality, you weren't a surgical candidate. But now that, that's, we have to think the other way around. There's a gene abnormality. We look, have to look harder for a surgical lesion because maybe patients will become a surgical candidate. So the last story I wanted to talk about was functional effects of a gene mutation and whether we can reverse the abnormal function. And this is a family with a severe form of autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy associated with psych psychiatric features and intellectual disability. And here you see a four-year-old girl with this disorder, in fact, a very severe form of this disorder. She does this many times every night. She's now 16 and she's actually regressed very severely. She's lost the ability to walk and she's rapidly going off her feet as well. In this family, we performed exome sequencing and our molecular collaborators found a mutation of a potassium channel called KCNT1. At the same time as we published this, a French group published the same gene with mutations that were de novo rather than inherited in a very severe epileptic encephalopathy where the children do not walk or talk, and they showed that there was gain of function. Now, my uh, physiology collaborators, Steve Petru and Carol Milligan, then studied these particular mutations in the Petri dish with uh, elect two electrode voltage clamp recording, and they looked at the severe autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy mutations and the migrating focal seizures, this devastating epileptic encephalopathy. And they showed that there was a gain of function in the nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy patients, but even greater gain of function in the epileptic encephalopathy. Now, Steve then remembered that quinidine, an old drug related to quinine, which you have in your gin and tonic, that quinidine is actually uh, works on this exact potassium channel. And quinidine uh, is approved as an antiarrhythmic drug and also used in malaria, but it does have a cardiac risk with it. So Steve and Carol put it into the Petri dish and had a look at the effects of quinidine and showed that quinidine actually reversed the gain of function that the mutations caused. So this is pretty exciting stuff, an old drug, new tricks. But then people have tried it, and there are just two reports so far. Here we have a 25-month-old girl who has this mutation reversed in the Petri dish. She was given the drug with quinidine. Seizures improved, but she made small developmental gains. And here we have a, a girl with focal epilepsy and regression, very similar to the girl I've shown you. And she was given quinidine, shows a little benefit here, but no benefit in the person. And here we have a boy with migrating focal seizures, a dramatic improvement in seizures with 80% seizure reduction but, um, and minimal developmental progress. So does it really work? These are open label studies. That is not the gold standard. So my colleague, Saul Mullen, has led a randomised, double-blind, crossover, placebo-controlled inpatient trial of the family I've just shown you and one other patient of mine. And he has found, with the use of quinidine, of video EEG monitoring, where we've recorded very carefully the seizure events, whether they're short seizures and long seizures, this is what they found. In the first men that we looked at, we found that we couldn't evaluate anything because the quinidine was toxic and caused long QT syndrome. In the younger folk in the family and the unrelated uh, young man, we found that in fact quinidine in a placebo phase and um, a drug and placebo are parts of a trial really was not effective. So that's pretty disappointing, a huge amount of work, but it does give us a clear answer. 
So what are the goals of such a trial? We need to have definite statistical uh, evidence of seizure improvement with a double-blind placebo randomised controlled trial. We need to aim for normal development in these very severely disabled kids. We need to have no comorbidities, no side effects, and we need to alter the aims of our drug trials to target these goals. So has epilepsy genetics changed our practice? Absolutely. And the first thing, and very importantly, getting a diagnosis makes a huge difference to families. People sometimes say, oh, well, it doesn't change anything. It does, because these families often have a lot of guilt around why they have such a disabled child, and it gives them an answer. It means they can end their diagnostic odyssey. They may not need to go on and have liver biopsies and muscle biopsies and other invasive tests. It enables us to do cohort studies of a new disease, um, and we can figure out which drugs work, but equally, which drugs do not work. We can understand the prognosis and the comorbidities of those disorders. We then need to work with our science colleagues to think about the mechanism, what's happening, what's, how is this disease occurring, and they can look in vitro and, of course, in vivo, and there are increasing numbers of zebrafish models of all these genes as well as animal models, mouse, etc. And then they can do therapeutic trials on these models, and then it's our job as clinical researchers to take it back uh, to the patients and see if it works, as I just showed you an example, and when it does work to help with implementation of new therapies. So in this talk, I hope I've shown you that these genetic mutations are giving us ideas about the mechanisms behind these diseases. I've emphasised the importance of both de novo and inherited mutations, uh, the increasing recognition about mosaicism, the importance of genotype and phenotype heterogeneity, and that genes can cause both lesional and non-lesional disorders, that we need to aim for targeted therapies. Uh, it may change the game in terms of epilepsy surgery. We can use functional changes and study those. And one of the interesting parts about the mTOR story is the biological convergence. It's all coming down to this one important pathway. And in a way, that's good because we don't have to treat one gene. We can treat a pathway. Very important for you to remember that these patients all need genetic counselling. If I find a gene change, they need to see the geneticists and have this explained. It's also important to acknowledge the important role of parent and community groups. And every gene gets its own group now, and that's fantastic for families because it offers them huge support. But also they then run conferences, they then run research funds, and then they get researchers to focus on their disease, and that is driving um, new treatments. And that's what we want, new treatments. We want to make sure that we can target their diseases. So I've given you a lot in a short time, but I wanted to acknowledge the brilliant team of people I work with. Um, our epilepsy genetics, our epilepsy group overall is headed by Sam Berkovic. I've shown you work of Saul Mullen and Steve Petru and Carol Milligan. And uh, as I said, Lynette has been an integral part of our program now for many, many years um, and has um, made a, a major contribution. And you'll hear more about her contribution in the next symposium at 3 o'clock. Just wanted to touch on my talk tonight. It actually is quite different. There's a whole bit about why you should do clinical research and women in science. So it's, it has got a different flavour to this talk. There's a little bit of the same as well. And finally, I wanted to acknowledge the fantastic patients and families. We couldn't do this without them, and they are, it's wonderful that we can give back to them with our scientific discoveries. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ingrid, for a fantastic talk. Um, we seem to have a little bit of time, so we could take some questions if anybody has any Dr. Stanley.
Yeah, look, that's, that's a fascinating idea. And I mentioned earlier that we really don't have a lot of understanding about environmental effects, and this would be a great way to start thinking about environmental effects in these diseases. Um, the main gut thing I think of with epilepsy is the ketogenic diet, of course, where we have a specific high-fat, low, low to almost no-carbohydrate uh, diet that works, and whether that could, in fact, be influencing the microbiota would also be interesting. Well, in the next talk, if you'd like to come <laughs> along, I'm going to present some very hot data. It's not actually even um, accepted yet, but hopefully will be. Um, looking at, at that, because we have talked about it being polygenic for a long time, and the most of the common epilepsy is being polygenic. And we just have um, the first raft of data from a big international study called Epi4K, where we've looked at... Uh, still relatively small numbers, uh, 640, I think it is, individuals with genetic generalised epilepsy and about 1,000 with focal epilepsy. And, you know, we thought we would get polygenic, but we're getting hits, rare variants in the known epilepsy genes. So maybe they, yeah, it's like, wow. But it also means the precision medicine role may be even more important than just the rare things. Um, so I think it's watched this space. We don't really understand. We know some of them. I mean, I haven't even touched today on copy number variants, which are very important. And we know we all have copy number variants, deletions, duplications, and we know that some are associated with epilepsy as susceptibility alleles that contribute, but in their own right are not the whole causation. So we have a little bit of knowledge about that, but not a great knowledge. I think there's a lot more to be done there. Yeah, it's being tried in lots of different ways in lots of boutique studies. We have one at the moment going on on ring chromosomes looking at that. Um, and it's, you know, opening up a whole new world. I can't give you a, a clear, uh, you know, it's changed the game on something yet, but I think that's a, an obvious next step lots of labs are pursuing. Any other questions? Um, I just have one question. <laughs> So it's really disappointing, the whole quinidine and SOLS trial, uh, because it would have been lovely if uh, it had worked in the autosomal dominant frontal lobe epilepsy. And it seems to maybe in the anecdotal um, trials, or the, the, the N of 1s in the uh, epileptic encephalopathy. But uh, so it works in the Petri dish. So why are we not getting an effect, do you think? I think the Petri dish is much more simple than the human brain. So I think that it's like the zebra fish and mouse models. They're not humans, are they? And mm -hmm. I think that we would like it to be simple, but the human brain is far from simple. Um, so that's the first thing. And I think also we know that with uh, any of these ion channels, the potassium channel, it depends which neuron it's on or non-neuron, which cells, are they excitatory, are they inhibitory, which circuits. So it's such a complex question. Uh, I think we, you know, we're, we're fooling ourselves a little bit with the Petri dish. The Petri dish is a start, but it's not the end. The other issue is Saul was so despondent after these results, which took like a year of his life, um, that he said, oh, it's dead. It's absolutely dead. I'm not sure it's absolutely dead. It's pretty dead, but I'm not sure it's absolutely <laughs> dead. But there is a related drug that we're now pursuing, so we're opening up the next thing along the same pathway. So we haven't given up on the... On the concept, it's just this one doesn't look like it's worked. Um, it's my great pleasure to um, thank you for your talk, Ingrid. Um, I think those of us who went to med school about my time, or maybe earlier, looking at, not looking at you, Kevin, um, <laughs> would not recognise epilepsy today. Uh, the changes and the discoveries that have been made are just amazing, and the fact that that translates into improved care is amazing. So this is very important research. We're very excited that we're part of it um, and that we share it with you and that our department is part of it through Lynette. And so thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your talk, and please accept this small gift. Thank you.